For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson with the latest readout video from our free Wednesday Wake Up email newsletter and asking you to subscribe to the channel and also please to the newsletter for all sorts of reasons, including that we can contact you if we get deplatformed and that we can pester you to support us financially because we are dependent on you to do what we do. Now before you dive for the off button, in this video I semi-achieve a long-standing ambition because I visit Adelaide, Australia, at least in spirit, to thank viewers there for making it number 12 on our all-time views by city list, and remarkably, Adelaide is the first of six cities down your way in that top 12. I haven't yet managed to see you personally, but I do thank you for seeing us. If you even can, through the blizzard, sandstorm, cyclone, or whatever we're meant to think is swirling about pretty much non-stop there, as everywhere, since the orthodox view is that 2024 had the worst weather ever, and never mind that silly old data. Euronews Green said, quote, From destruction to deadly heat, photojournalists capture the reality of climate change in 2024, end quote. Destruction, no less. And they took lots of photos, so if the world ended and nobody noticed, they could show us later. The Guardian opined, quote, What is the real toll of natural and climate disasters? Science has staggering new answers, end quote. Staggering, no less. And indeed, Flipboard staggered to an Associated Press feature, Hallmarks of climate change seen in floods, fires, and drought around the globe. Canada's Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, Climate Change and Climate Change, hollered, quote, Canadians are increasingly experiencing record-breaking extreme weather that threatens our homes and livelihoods, makes groceries more expensive, harms our personal health, drives up insurance rates, and imposes significant costs across the, the supply chains of our economy, end quote. Yep, never mind bad economic policy, inflation is caused by climate change. Just like all the bad weather that uh, isn't happening according to actual data. The Associated Press story insisted that, quote, the hallmarks of climate change, extreme heat and drought, larger, more intensive wildfires and supercharged hurricanes, typhoons and rainstorms that lead to catastrophic flooding are being seen and felt around the globe, end quote. But if that's the case, it should be fairly easy to catalog it, and they don't even try. As for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it worries that some of this stuff might be going to happen. But these people talk as though it just started, has been going on for quite some time, and is about to hit with redoubled fury. Moreover, when Euronews Green asked in the fall, quote, why is Europe experiencing such extremes in its weather and what can be done, end quote, they made no effort to argue or demonstrate that it was happening. Instead, you got the usual argument by cliché, quote, experts warn that European leaders need to address the concerning trends in weather across the continent, and fast, end quote. The concerning trends being, basically, that there was weather. Quote, in the north of the continent, temperatures have been far below average, with significantly more rain than normal, while the south is battling heat waves and wildfires, end quote. And if the north were experiencing heat, and the south cold and wet, would they say that too was climate change? Of course they would, but a theory that predicts everything predicts nothing. And still gets it wrong. As Roger Pilkey Jr. asked this summer, quote, why is it that the scientific assessments of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are so different than what is reported in the media, proclaimed in policy, and promoted by the most public-facing climate experts? And why can't that gap be closed, end quote? Well, clearly, one reason is that most climate journalists not only don't read contrarians like RPJ, they don't read IPCC reports. Because, as he also wrote in July 2024, quote, According to the IPCC, we cannot in fact simply look out the window and observe climate change, even for video-friendly hurricanes, floods, and drought. In fact, the IPCC currently concludes that we will not this century be able to detect with high confidence changes in the statistics of most weather events beyond internal variability. And this holds even if the world were to follow a projected implausible RCP 8.5 future, end quote. And, speaking of a theory that predicts everything and hence nothing, The Guardian, having heartily endorsed all the policies that led to high energy prices while denying the reality that they make freezing weather a disaster, complains that, quote, 9 million homes will face higher energy bills from Wednesday as Britain braces for freezing temperatures and snow warnings for the New Year period, end quote. Snow? The stuff we were told in 2007 that children wouldn't recognize? 
And what of the miracle of reliable, cheap alternative energy to run the massive air conditioning units that will replace probably banned furnaces as the UK boils? It seems someone has blundered, and a lot of other people are going to pay a high price for their ignorant arrogance. In the newsletter, we also note that Jiva Lang at Heatmap offers us, quote, 18 climate books to read in 2025, and another 14 honorable mentions for the heck of it, end quote. So, never mind Shakespeare, we've got Madeline Watts, because Lang is really into cli-fi, which, instead of talking about what is happening, howls about what might be happening in an alternative reality. So, not everything on her list is intentionally fiction, but we say, if you're really in the fortunate position that you might read 32 books in the coming year, uh, try to broaden your focus a bit, and also sharpen it a bit. Ah, and the same Jiva Lang also warned of the end of winter. <sighs> Specifically, quote, When there is no snow, that long winter night feels even more endless. As temperatures warm around the globe, snowfall is noticeably declining, which actually makes winters in northern climates darker since snow reflects so much light. With some parts of the U.S. set to lose 10% to 20% of their snowpack per decade due to climate change, darker and rainier winters are likely in store for millions of us, end quote. Except winter snowpack is not diminishing in North America, just in Cli-Fi. Meanwhile, the climate-obsessed climate obsessives at the New York Times say, quote, to imagine the kind of future a hotter, drier climate may bring and the geopolitical challenges it will create, look no further than two parts of the world that Donald Trump wants America to control, Greenland and the Panama Canal, end quote. Right. Because we all know Trump is a committed climate alarmist and drought is closing the canal, so he wants to grab the resulting ditch to plant kale? Now for some semi-good news. Climate Home News emailed, quote, we recently asked you what the top climate themes of 2025 would be. You told us you wanted to see more ambition on cutting emissions, adapting to climate change, and protecting nature, end quote. So more of the same, including hopeless vagueness. But they went on, quote, and you'd like more honesty and straight talking and less jargon, misinformation, and accounting tricks when it comes to climate policy and action, end quote. And that's a good idea, even if, and we want to make this absolutely clear, it means admitting that things vital to the non-existent green energy transition aren't working, can't work, or don't even make sense. For instance, there's something laughable about more ambition on cutting emissions. What else have all these cops displayed, only to find that, as Thomas Sowell long ago warned such people in vain, reality is tricky. So how about instead we get more performance and less empty virtue signaling? As to protecting nature, we are non-sarcastically in total agreement here. So, let's obsess less about carbon pollution that promotes plant growth and thus, through the miraculous cycle of life, feeds herbivores who feed carnivores and everyone bursts into song. Okay, skip the song. But seriously, let's put some of the time, effort, public money, and idealism being flung at climate change into things like protecting habitats. In short, let's take the monomania out of environmentalism. On the subject of straight talk and hard data, we also noted in the newsletter that Morgan Stanley just bailed on Mark Carney's net zero banking alliance, like Citigroup and Bank of America. Bloomberg blames the Republican Party, but we say, give reality some credit. Many executives probably genuinely believed it could be done, and that we'd all get rich doing it, while others were probably just trying to buy cheap goodwill. But we're confident that both groups have realized they'd been deceived. And the closer we get to those famously ambitious climate targets, the more people are going to do the math and discover that it doesn't say what they expected or wanted it to. In the newsletter, we further complain that various news outlets pass on some propaganda about the end of Canadian winter that totally miss the obvious point. According to the CBC version, the cities of Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, and Ottawa have lost 19, 13, 6, five, and four days below zero Celsius between 2014 and 2023. But the provinces they're in have only lost four for BC, two for Ontario, one for Quebec, two for Alberta, and Ontario again, two. So what we are clearly seeing here isn't the end of winter, it's an urban heat island effect, QNED. 
Having made that point, we then launched a new series, Look It Up, in which we survey where to get useful climate data on matters that keep coming up in discussions and, for that matter, in rants. And we started with the NOAA's Climate at a Glance time series. Now, it relies heavily on the surface thermometer record, which is subject to a lot of dodgy kludging to make the past colder and the present warmer. But even with their thumb on the scale, the temperature data still shows patterns that will surprise your neighborhood alarmist. For instance, if you select average temperature on a one-month time scale for all the months from 1895 to 2024 in the United States, you get this picture. Not exactly panic-inducing, is it? Now, the black line there is not a trend line. It's the 1901 to 2000 average that they inserted. But we downloaded the data and did the trend, and the result was 0.18 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, or about 1 degree Celsius per century. Also, the main change since the late 1970s is that the coldest months are a bit less cold, whereas the hottest months are about the same as they've always been. And the July maximum temperatures, and again, the black line here is not a trend, it's the average from 1901 to 2000, show that the biggest variability and the fastest upward trend both came early in the record. Uh, so, was there a dramatic human influence on climate between 1895 and 1935 that then tapered off? And remember, this chart is what you get after they've monkeyed with the data. So just imagine if they'd used the actual thermometer readings. Oh, and we also used their handy data table below the graph to get the top 10 warmest monthly averages in that record. And how weird is this? The 1930s hold three of the top nine spots as against only one appearance for the supposedly blazing 2020s or 2010s, and sixth place was well over a century ago. And another evidence-based thing. As we noted at the outset, among lazy slogan-slinging alarmists, nothing is more common than to insist that global warming means more and more extreme weather. But a new study by a team of Chinese meteorologists, led by Shi Fei Tu of Guangdong Ocean University, shows that there's been a decreasing trend in the destructive potential of tropical cyclones in the southern Indian Ocean since the mid-1990s. The trend has been down elsewhere in the world as well, though only in the SIO is the trend significant. But nowhere is it up, and that is significant. Finally, from the CO2Science.org archive, what's up, Doc? Well, CO2 is, and so, apparently, are carrots. Daucus carota L. varicitivus was subjected to an additional 300 parts per million of CO2 in five experiments between 1987 and 2008, and the mean increase in plant dry weight was 77.8%, with the best results occurring at high temperatures. So toss them into your stew this winter and thank CO2 that they're growing better than ever. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and Australians can now thank me for not opening with a feeble crocodile Dundee imitation. Might. <laughs>